The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Welcome once again to a lecture on Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra. Picking up from where we left off, halfway through the second movement, titled Bygones. Here we're getting into some beautifully mysterious scoring, and it is very cinematic. In fact, there are so many bits <laughs> that have been stolen and repurposed and reinterpreted and just basically the entire ethos has been imitated while the musical content of course has been adapted to whatever composer's individual voice was in particular this section right here is so reminiscent of Holst particularly in the beginning of the movement Saturn, where you have very, very soft harp and low flutes, and the entire movement of Neptune, which heavily features low flutes and celesta. It's interesting to note, just in terms of structure, and not comparing this to any other work, that Schoenberg can allow the music to lock into certain patterns and then develop the music in front of it. It's not the situation where some have perceived that there is no repetition, there are no patterns, that every single bar is somehow randomized. That really is not where this style of music is coming from. Especially with early Schoenberg, there is a sense of using certain approaches, strategies, structures of music that he had before, and yet just taking away the sense of a tonal center. That's really, to my ears, what is happening through most of this suite. That said, this repetition is not allowed to go on for very long without adding another element to it. And that is something in general whenever you see Schoenberg getting into some kind of pattern or settled place in the music, he'll start to introduce more and more elements from outside until it changes the music or pushes it in another direction. In this case, it is this tenor register ditty, I guess you could call it, nicely crossing pretty much the entire tenor register of the instrument all the way down to a D. That just is really cool, the way it inhabits that entire area, and then of course goes quite a bit farther. This <laughs> feels like it is straight out of a John Williams score. This is a whole tone scale starting on D with an altered sixth step up to C sharp instead of C natural. And that just has a wonderful opening out feeling. And of course, after this, in a cinematic score, you would hear the music change to something else, right? But here it's just an element thrown in there, but it has been copied relentlessly. The idea of a mysterious, slightly out of whack kind of a scale that leads from mystery to greater mystery or to deeper music or to a place where the music either suddenly relaxes or gains a new kind of tension. This is also lovely. This little Romani type of improv here. That's very nice. It's really cool the way that there is this sudden lining up of pitches right here. This high F sharp. And then here, this trill on a written D sharp, which is... Remember your transpositions? Concert F sharp. And he just says, just trill all the way through here. Right, and there is a dashed tie here because the trill is a series of randomized alternate pitches 
So he's telling the player to use one breath all the way across here. It's really kind of unnecessary to mark a dashed slur, but that may have been just part of the notation approach that Schoenberg had. And notice that he's got this little bracket here. <laughs> so the trill may or may not have been intended to go all the way to the end. And it probably is one of these things that just depends on how fast the conductor is conducting this. So if it's a little slower, you can get in a few more back and forths here on the trill. And if it's a little faster, then the entire thing can just come to an end on a single D sharp right here. Now we see all the other instruments kind of reacting and coming in with the same pattern. Notice we've got this starting up here on this high A and then the second bassoon coming in and playing on a high A and then the bass clarinet playing on the equivalent of that same A written B sounding down a ninth on concert A. Kind of interesting how bass clarinet parts and tenor clef parts will share the same staff positions for the notes but of course very different in terms of where the accidentals go or somewhat different. Then here we've got our A clarinet here coming in on written C written C sounding A because it's an A clarinet so that's that same A and so on so all down the line including this English horn part here once again sounding down a fifth which is A so after a while it just starts to sound like a chord going back and forth and back and forth it's harder to pick out these entrances after the third or fourth entrance as being something unique and not just a repeated chord usually you will not see a clarinet part with an ottava mark under it. But that is just for the publisher's convenience in presenting a full score. This is not going to be in the part. Even at that, Schoenberg is not happy to let this continue on back and forth mindlessly, so he starts to vary the frequency in terms of the rhythmic pulse. So it changes to triplets on the same two notes for the English horn and then sextuplets for the first clarinet and so on. So there is a sense of separation inside the chord. Now one thing that you're going to notice here, there is so much clouding over of the pitches. There's so much busyness, so much going on right in that particular range that what you'll be able to hear from the xylophone are its overtones, which are going to sound octaves higher than the fundamental note. And in fact, it's going to be hard to hear anything else but this sort of back and forth playing, even at triple P. This little ting on the triangle and boosh on the cymbal is going to be extremely delicate and it'll be very hard to make out. And like I said, you're not really going to hear the fundamental of the xylophone at all. We have this Romani type of noodling on the first violin. And below it, you will see the viola playing almost perfectly in contrary motion, crossing voices. And that is such a cool idea. Now, it's not a perfect mirror in terms of pitch relationships, but it is just in terms of motion. When one part goes down, the other part goes up and vice versa. This is all really no big deal to play going up here to this E flat and F sharp. And in fact, that could have just been written in the viola standard alto clef. But once again, the copyist may be trying to save a little bit of space here. But when you add it all up together, it has this wonderful contrast between the eerily mysterious, that kind of settled but unsettled feeling, which has this strange, busy little background motive dancing along. This really is a foreground element, right? Uh, this flute and celesta together. And the bassoon comes in 
almost more just like a little extra detail and doesn't start to take over until there is more of a mass of sound. Little bits and pieces around it really are just a little bit of icing. I especially love this, the way that these octaves line up unexpectedly just for one second. It almost has kind of a bell-like sound to it because of the way the overtones work. One last thing added to this is the ritardando, and that really helps these players to produce a more expressive line that isn't just a bunch of random notes that are sort of playing all over the place. It really does help bring a sense of meaning to this phrase. So let's have a listen to that. It's a really cool way to jump into this second lecture because it's not a huge amount to think about at first, but we'll make up for that on the next screen, which is just amazingly complex. But let's have a listen to this first now. Here on the next page, the music immediately picks up tempo from that last ritardando, and we see the beginning of that little staccato motive from the previous page being traded off between second clarinet and first bassoon, just back and forth over and over and over again. And it pretty much just continues throughout this entire page. Now, don't get confused by these apparent changes of tempo. Schoenberg is just mathematically working things out for you as the conductor in terms of how to keep this tempo going if you are going to conduct these little fours against the three beats per measure, right? So that would end up as 132 rather than 100. But the actual tempo is exactly the same throughout all of this, which you can hear if you just listen to this little fluttering, jumping back and forth pattern that goes on in the background. There is more lovely tone painting going on here, especially right here with the combination of first oboe, first clarinet, and solo viola. So if everybody balances here, which is not as hard to do as you think, because the viola has a way of borrowing other tonalities into itself. If the other players are sensitive and they do try to merge. See, here is where I feel that Schoenberg's admonition to just allow the players to play at the assigned dynamics and not worry about balancing. Here's where I feel that that is all a bunch of hooey. Because if the players are really listening to each other here, and they allow themselves to merge, the wind players allow themselves to merge with the solo viola's sound, then you have a really gorgeous, beautiful blended tone, as you're going to hear in a little while when I play the Hytink recording along to this screen. If everybody was really playing their own version of piano, you would not hear that blending at all. You would just hear a blending between the oboe and the clarinet. But Adding the viola here is really the glue that makes that work. Because you see, right here we've got the oboe in a lovely, comfortable register, nice and strong, and the clarinet in its lower clarino, which could be a little piercing, but when you add the solo viola to it, then it just really blends out the tones together. All right, I won't go into huge detail about it. It's really easy to allow one's perception to really follow one line in atonal music that is polyphonic and not pay attention to the others. That is what I would feel would be the caution here, is that you kind of have to listen to it a few times before you really start to hear all of the elements. 
in tonal music that's not as big of a concern because usually there are certain structures built into the music to where the tonality of a passage supports certain lines coming in and coming out but atonal music does not have that kind of support nevertheless this is a lovely cello line and it's easy to not actually hear it right to just let yourself be distracted by these upper lines here the Hauptstimme of the oboe clarinet and viola and then this little bit of Nebenstimme here secondary line in the sopranino clarinet which actually does stand out nicely another thing that is easy to overlook is this tuba entrance right here beautiful low a flat pianissimo now if there were ever an instrument to do that kind of entrance it is the tuba it is so much easier for a tuba to come in incredibly softly down there on those low notes than say a bass trombone. I mean, bass trombone can play beautifully down there too, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have the same real background feeling. It's also easy to miscalculate the benefits that this brings to the whole color of what's going on over it, right? The overtones, the sense of presence of the tuba and everything else really does help get this passage started. So, oboe clarinet viola, cello coming in, answered by piccolo clarinet, and then this is also considered to be Nebenstimme. Interesting relationship here <laughs> that is easy to overlook. Right when this starts on a concert F sharp, sounding down a fifth, we have a little bit of pizzicato in the basses and that helps to kind of kick this off. I feel that this really just is a note of support to help guide the ear to the beginning of this line. And then once again Hauptstimme coming in here with tutti violins this time rather than solo and compared to all of these other instruments playing triple P, blended tone, and so on and so forth, this really can hold its own over the tail ends of these other lines at piano. So piano, tutti, continuing on, developing that idea. We have the cellos coming in, Nebenstimme in their tenor register, and things start to coalesce here. Uh, Atu oboes here, along with piccolo clarinet, coming in and here everybody just really goes for it. At this point I would just stop the lecture and let you listen to this page but it doesn't really stop here. It's hard to really explain the second page without having immediately talked about the first page so let's just keep that in mind, bear with me, and let's take a look at this last bar as it goes into the next screen. Here we've got this lovely combination here, celesta, harp, and xylophone. Now remember your transpositions, xylophone and celesta are both octave sounding instruments, so essentially this is just doubling what's going on with the harp, and xylophone is taking the top line. My only critique here would be that I think the harp is going to sound sort of invisible right here, especially with the attention of the listener distracted by all of these other things. Namely, piccolo on that same high note there, and then atu oboes, doubling the lower notes, and so on. The first clarinet doubling the oboes as well. So add that all together and the harp is going to tend to disappear if it weren't enough just that these mallet instruments, technically celesta is kind of a mallet instrument, that that kind of percussive sound is playing right on top of it. And here's where I feel two harpists would have worked great. That would have brought more of the harp tone forward. Here this really is just a continuation 
of everything that was happening before. We see this repeating pattern continuing on, just faithfully going on for the rest of the entire page. And that, more than anything else, is what makes me feel that this is all one idea with the previous page, despite the tempo change and everything else. But there is so much to unpack on this page. I won't go into enormous detail because there is a lot that you need to discover on your own, but you also need some guidance, possibly, if you are a beginning orchestrator in being able to comprehend massive tutees like this, especially when there is so much going on differently in different parts. So let's try to break down some of the action just in general so you can see what is doubling where and make what sense you can out of that. The first thing that we see here is that first flute and first piccolo are doubling at pitch. And that is an effective doubling right in that exact register for the piccolo. So this is piccolo starting to gain power towards the top of the staff. It's definitely going into its middle high register and that is really where it starts to shine. And right here we've got flute just barely scraping the place to where it starts to lose a little bit of control over its dynamics. This high A would be about the highest that I would ever score and mark piano under, right? Piano crescendo coming from the previous page. So this will all be about maybe mezzo piano or even a little bit mezzo forte if the conductor is leaning into it a bit. But it isn't marked here at the beginning. This is something where I would have actually marked the dynamics considering the crescendo quality of the previous bar. But anyhow, all that aside, we've got these instruments doubling and playing out this line, but that isn't everything that is going on with that particular line, because if you just use your eagle eye, you will see that first clarinet is also playing that line, right? Sounding down a third. And so is xylophone. Now, notice that Schoenberg is not going to mark what is kind of meaningless, which would be a half note for xylophone. Xylophone tones are just really short, very much like timpani strokes, right? Where the hall resonance is really what extends the sound. And the same thing is true with xylophone. Xylophone tones are so percussive that they tend to excite the reverb in a hall and they have their own sense of sustain in that way in terms of the relationship of where they are. There's nothing more dead sounding than xylophone in a room with no presence, right? And that's what you'll hear on some older recordings that were made in the 50s, where they were really trying to get rid of any trace whatsoever of presence. They really wanted dead rooms within which to record their work. So you'll hear things that just sound so tubby and lifeless, and it's just really tragic, I feel. But occasionally some of those recordings will be remastered, and the producer of the restoration will add some presence, add some life to the recording electronically, and then immediately things start to sound better. Not as good as they could, but better. Now you would think that that really is pretty much all that is going on in terms of this line being doubled, right? The xylophone, piccolo, and first flute taking the top of the octave and the clarinet taking the bottom of the octave, but that is actually wrong because the harp and celesta are both playing these patterns and you'll notice that the beginning of each group of nine sixteenth notes which are interpreted as three sets of six in this way beamed a little strangely but yeah the beginnings of each of these groups are the same notes too and Schoenberg interprets the rest of the harmony inherent in that line with these arpeggios that flow down from those notes. 
So when you put all that together, this is actually a fairly prominent line, and yet it's marked Nebenstimme, right? So you see that little N there, there, here in the clarinet, not even bothering to mark it in the xylophone, it's just going to be what it is. Okay, so that is that line. Now, let's talk about everything that is sort of framing that, starting from the bottom now. We've got double basses right in here, picking up from what happened before. I could have talked about that, but it really isn't that important. Then we've got tuba plus double bass, which makes a nice solid sound. It's actually playing an octave higher than this pitch. And there's just a little touch of this punctuating pizzicato happening, which will relate to other elements that are happening in the music. Tuba is going to finish this up with the addition of the third trombone, and then going on into this right here, but we will talk about that a little bit later. Okay. <laughs> now here's our Hauptstimme, is these big reaching lines, and I really love the way that they're set up. It's just all the violinists just pushing into this, mezzo forte to forte, and then ending up with a C sharp just in the first violins. And what that does is it just really helps the line to tail off, right? Just by reducing the amount of players. If all of these players were finishing up on this C sharp, it would have less of a drawback right at the end. So it's almost as if you could put a little dashed diminuendo hairpin right in here, and that would express a little bit more of what's going on here. That is repeated again, and again, and then a new section starts, which I'll talk about in a minute. That in itself is something of an echo of what is happening below. And if we take a look, here we can see that very, very clearly written as Nebenstimme, right? So it's kind of an interesting division here of first horn and then all the others below. So A3, ah, we've got these horn players just really pushing this. Forte crescendo, and yet they're marked Nebenstimme. And these violins are starting with mezzo forte, and they're marked Hauptstimme. So I'll let you puzzle that one out. But probably the best way to think about this is really that the players are going to be pushing into forte rather than starting at forte and pushing. And there's some thickening here of these three horns by the second bassoon. Once again, dropping out a little bit to just allow this to have more push and then just a natural drawback in it right here on this first, just like here. That continues on and it's joined right here by English horn. So that just allows the line to thicken, but the same approach is happening here of the line gradually thickening by the A2 oboes in the Hauptstimme part. Okay, <laughs> so they're just some natural architectural dynamics rather than nuances happening in there. Just architectural dynamics are just when you remove or add elements without necessarily having them fluctuate, right? It's just building, it's sort of like terrace dynamics, but it's almost like adding building blocks. So now you have pretty much covered all of the elements that are going on here. Now there are some internal elements that I didn't cover, like this little clarinet written B flat to A natural, right? And this lovely thing that's going on in here, which is basically tremolo, sul ponticello, violas, doubling the cellos. And it's interesting how the cellos are the ones to draw back rather than the violas. And there's also some flutter tonguing trumpet right in here, kind of brrrr kind of thing happening twice, but still kept fairly soft. And this will be more of a subtle background element if it's done right. Once again, forgive me, I keep forgetting to mention bass clarinet. 
uh, the bass clarinet is an element that is playing along here, in this case, doubling the tuba, and right in here, doubling that note in the double basses. Sorry about that. So that is pretty much all the elements that are going on here in these two and a half bars. So you can see it is just really is a lot to keep track of. So many things going on, an explosion of ideas. And these sort of continue on right in here as the music winds down, little bits and pieces just trading off here. The horn Nebenstimme trading off with the violin Nebenstimme just limited down to the first violins only, you know, leaving out the second violins, and then just a solo violin, really, once again, architecturally subtracting. Until finally you have just really the barest of elements, and right over this little drawing back of elements, you get the harp and celesta playing together. And once again, I feel you're just going to really hear the celesta here rather than the harp. And it's a pity because I think with two harps, this part would come out a lot better. And that just sets us up for this beautiful low E flat that just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And it's one of these cases where at that level of softness, it's not really going to be heard all that much. It's probably going to be okay for the player to sneak a breath if they need to. Although it's not all that long either. So if the player has got a good set of lungs, good breath control, then they will be able to pretty much cover all that in one breath. This is difficult to hear against what's going on here. And what I have to mention here, once again, if you didn't see the intro video that I released a week ago, this is a very imitated <laughs> back and forth low flutes and piccolos kind of sound. The Jerry Goldsmith score to Alien borrows this. And ever since then, film composers have been borrowing that idea. Little intervals bouncing back and forth in low flutes or middle register flutes in a mysterious way. It's really cool though what Schoenberg does here in the original I feel is better than any of its imitations. The first players both in piccolo and flute are allowed to just hang on to the harmony and the second players bounce back and forth over that held pitch. Not to mention this little trill here on sounding C to sounding D natural. Just very, very small in the background. Triple P once again. Even at that, it's how soft everybody is being. It'll still be hard to hear this against what's going on there. But you will hear this nice little quasi trill. And in fact, this is pretty much the same notes as the sopranino clarinet. So if the players are listening to each other, I would actually have them, if I were conducting this, I would have the sopranino clarinet play the same exact rhythmic values here so that it's in sync. And then, of course, this is lovely, adding all these harmonics here at the end. Here it says, possibly harmonic. <laughs> I think we've seen this before. Okay, it is not actually possibly harmonic. These tones below could be interpreted as harmonics. It's better just to play the top two tones as written and then the bottom two as harmonics on the strings an octave lower. But this will come through a lot stronger right in here. Then the celesta joins in on what's going on with the second flute and second piccolo. Now this is really wonderful. This G-sharp harmonic. And you'll notice in the recording that I'm using that it is a little out of whack. It is just slightly off in terms of intonation. Now, I happen to feel that weirdness of intonation is a cool element. But the reason why it is weird 
in intonation, even though the orchestra is first rate, is because, look at this, there are six short bars in which the contrabass players, six of them, are to retune their G string to G sharp and play an octave harmonic. Okay, well, you know, that is kind of hard and it's just part of the era. The new era where you just ask a little bit more from the players and you see what works and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work, but the fact that it doesn't work that well doesn't make it into the history books or into the orchestration manuals. It is working to the extent that you hear it on the recording and you hear that G sharp come in very spookily and a bit out of intonation. It is not working in the sense that the players probably feel really embarrassed about it. So really be cautious. It just really depends on who you're working with and what can you ask for in a general way from all players in your orchestrations from then on. Now if you're working on a film score and you know the people that you're going to be working with and you've got all the time in the world to just work on the cues and you've got players who are first rate and they're used to doing this kind of stuff all the time and they can just drop into a recording and out of it, that's one thing. But when you are writing a score for hopefully dozens, hundreds maybe, of performances with many different orchestras across the world, you hope, you have to think about what is generally going to work and whether it is going to come off all that well. In this case, I would say it's just kind of tough on the player. I remember working with a timpani player and that timpanist was really particular about making sure that the pitches that he played were really right in the center of the pitch range of each timpani that he struck so that it would have exactly the right amount of bounce. And if you wrote things that forced him to have a drum head that was too tight or too loose, he would really get mad at you. <laughs> and he didn't get mad at me uh, because I was already aware of that and I was trying to score in a way that it all was logical. But he would just go on and on. That was his pet peeve, right? So just think about those kinds of things, you know, whether or not they are really contributing what you need them to contribute to a score. So listen for all of those things, and including all the things I didn't have time to talk about, like these low fourth horn notes, this lovely little xylophone plus unmuted first trumpet, and so on. All of those little touches. And I would say just keep rewinding and listening to these three bars and trying to pick out each of the different elements and then see how they all work together in your consciousness. Not to mention the way that these lines interweave. I mean, this is all lovely and fun and tricky, all of these interweaving patterns that we've got right in here. But the whole point of this screen is really these lovely Hauptstimme slash Nebenstimme lines interacting and then pushing upwards into the next page. So listen to all that and then I'll see you for the last screen of this lecture. From the tail end of those quite possibly out of intonation double basses on that high harmonic, we go right back into the opening idea. This time played by first oboe. And 
just a little touch here. Notice how the bass clarinet and first bassoon play this little doobly kind of thing. This is now bass clarinet on the concert A and bassoon on the concert D. But they are basically just kicking off these low horn notes. And notice how everything is nicely doubled. This goes back to the common sense approach of low horn scoring. And that is to really try to double low horns as much as you possibly can. And that also counts here for very soft muted horns. And really, we're revisiting this whole thing again. We've got the descending fourths, sometimes perfect, sometimes augmented. And that is under that opening melody. Bum, 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 right? Just something that could possibly be like a little nursery rhyme or a little snatch of something from Schoenberg's past or maybe something that people of that day would have recognized as being an older melody or just felt like some older children's melody or basic song of their youth. And what is so cool here is that the music resolves. It has a resolution. It suddenly feels like tonal music. Here we've got the same basic idea that we had before, this time just played by first and second flute. And that is against this lovely concert F sharp that goes on and on and on and on. This is one of those instances where the English horn player might sneak a breath here or there, and possibly play it right in here. I mean, it is something that is possible. It's just uh, you have to remember that double reed players can play for longer than the time in which they would need to replenish their lungs before passing out, okay? So you can assign them very, very long lines and they might just find a place where nobody's really paying any attention to them anymore and then do a circular breath just to get some more air into their lungs so that they are not going to lack oxygen. Anyway, <laughs> that's just a really long F sharp. Immediately, the Celesta plays, but you know, it doesn't really betray the sense of resolution here. When you think about it, uh, this is really lovely too, the piccolo playing a couple of notes that are Celesta-like. So it fits right into the pattern and locks all together really nicely going across there. So Schoenberg is not going to allow the listener to become complacent though, because he's going to start throwing in elements that work against the sense of resolution here. And that starts off with Hauptstimme in solo viola and solo cello, basically playing the same exact pitches along with some harmonization here from second muted trumpet. This goes back to what we saw a couple of screens ago, where we had Hauptstimme lines kind of stepping on each other's toes a little bit. Occasionally you'll get a beautiful low bass note or bass interval, like say right here when you've got this low A in the cello and a low D on contrabassoon. And right here, another low D, an octave higher. Remember how I was talking about octaves in contrabassoon and bass clarinet make a beautiful, cold, open tone? And that's what you'll get here, is you'll get that D octave plus the cello taking the fifth above the bass clarinet's D. But that really is a subsidiary element, just a little touch of low tone underneath this seemingly resolved pattern. And of course it changes right away here with the A flat. This is also D here, going to D flat. But really where your attention is going to be on is the entrance of the second clarinet here doubling with 
the first trombone. And this is the C part, so it's basically this transposed part is going to be playing these same pitches. There will be a little bit of a snarly sound to these players if they are adopting a certain aesthetic to their muted playing. And maybe a gentler sound if they are going with that other aesthetic which I talked about before. And then we've got some more lines interacting going on here. Horns. I love this solo cello line right in here, which, by the way, is being doubled by first clarinet. So it all ends up right here, just down to the English horn player, who is doubling the two T cellos. And here we get direct trading off of the melody, going from there to bass clarinet plus third trombone. That is going to be a beautiful combination. And that is giving way to a two bassoons plus first horn. Notice that as each of these elements gives over to the next element, it holds a tone. So you get this gradual addition of long tones leading towards this final chord. Then there's a wonderful trading off of different elements being added. Tuba, pizzicato double bass, which also helps to kind of start this low tone here in the contrabassoon. Now notice he says the low E flat must be played, right? So he's hoping for basses with C extensions or five-string basses, or maybe even score to Tura right there. Then, right here, this little bit of triangle, adding the muted trumpets and the celesta all together. That's very, very cool. And this last little note of celesta is exactly the same pitch as this first piccolo. Then all of these other elements add together, once again, possibly harmonic, that, that is not possible. Schoenberg must not have known that much about harp. The thing that is possible to play are the bottom three pitches. So those would have to be played at the written pitch without the ottava, sounding an octave higher, and then these top three would be just played as regular plucked pitches. Little touch of xylophone on that, which is probably the thing that you're going to hear the most. And right into that mix, we have a three clarinets, so they're all just playing the same pitches here. The F sharp here sounding up a minor third on A, and of course these A clarinets interpreting their written C as an A as well. So this triple line plays very softly, pushes out of the texture right here, and these wonderful harmonics all adding together, and then just tails off right there, and that leads perfectly into the next movement. Chord Colors, or Summer Morning by a Lakeside. Depending on how much you want to buy in to Schoenberg's reluctant <laughs> movement names. So listen for all those things to how this comes back, that same low D fifth, the descending fourths, the little bit of melody one more time, leading to a sense of resolution, which is immediately subverted by all of these little themes that push the sense of settled harmony farther and farther away from the listener. And then just the wonderful way that these elements trade off while they continue themselves, each one, to hold down a particular pitch, which eventually leads to this wonderful, huge, unsettled chord right at the end. And I will see you in a few days, hopefully, for one single lecture covering the entire third movement. And then after that, over the rest of the month, an additional two lectures dedicated to movement four. We'll actually be getting through this piece fairly quickly with the fifth and final movement covered in three lectures in December. So that is just right around the corner and then we'll have covered this entire piece in just three and a half months. 
and I think that's a pretty good speed for this. It is a shorter piece, it is a monument to incredible orchestration, and it has found its way into the ideas of many orchestrators and composers since then, especially in terms of film music, which I'm really hoping that this will address. Then after that, it is on to more lectures on some music that you might be quite a bit more familiar with. Not to say that I want to constantly appeal to your comfort zone, but more just that there are some pieces that are next in line that I've really put off a long time. If I want to make a comprehensive series of great music from around that time, which still has relevance today for us as orchestrators.